What's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all well. Just wanted to do a massive shout out to everyone who has hit like and subscribe recently. We've now gone past 45,000 subscribers here on YouTube. So I just wanted to say thanks. Massive appreciation to everyone who's taken the time to watch the content, like it, comment and subscribe. Please, if you're new here, uh, if you just this is the first video you've ever seen, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I really, really, really appreciate it. For today's video, we're going to talk about the Manchester United sale. Now, it might not have escaped your attention that at the back end of November last year, the owners of Manchester United, the Glazer family, put out a conveyal statement where they said that they were exploring all strategies to seek external investment into Manchester United, including the possibility of a sale. Fast forward a year, we are none the wiser as to who is going to win this race or when. We're led to believe through the various media updates that there are two main horses in the running for this. Sir Jim Radcliffe, the CEO and founder of the Ineos Group, and Sheikh Jassim bin Jebba Al Thani, let's just call him Sheikh Jassim for short, who is the son of the former ruler of Qatar and the president of one of their largest and most influential investment banks. Now you might be thinking, well, We've seen numerous updates on this. Here in the UK, we've got Sky Sports and the BBC. In America, you've got ABC, CBS, ESPN. And of course, anyone on socials is probably signed up to any one of a number of fanboy YouTube channels. And you might all be thinking, hey, we get updates on the daily about this. Why the hell should we listen to Adscast? Well, unfortunately, most of the updates, most of the news, uh, and most of the inside information that you've probably heard over the last year has been... How can I put this? Wrong. There's been misinformation, there's been speculation, and they've been so wide of the point, it's almost laughable. The reason for doing this video is to explain some of the intricacies, to shed some, some light, and to give some true information to anyone who's got a vested interest, such as a diehard Manchester United fan, or even for the casual observer. Because regardless of whether or not you care if Manchester United gets sold, Regardless if you're a fan of a rival club and you're just happy to see Manchester United pulled from pillar to post, it's important that this process of one of the world's largest, most well-known sporting institutions at least has fair and accurate information out there in the ether so that anyone who does give half a stuff, does have any interest, at least understands what is going on. The what, the why and the how. Now, what I can't do is tell you which horse is going to win this race, because if I did, if I did know that, I would be putting a bet on that, and I'd be laughing all the way to the bank with my winnings, and I wouldn't share that information with anyone. But what I can do is explain the intricacies and all the various plates being spun in this, which explains why this process has been so protracted, and to give an idea of when potentially we might actually get an update and a resolution to this. Now I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well hang on a second, I get all my updates from all my other news feeds, the TV, YouTube already. Why the hell should I care what Adscars have got to say? Um, well we have a bit of a track record when it comes to predicting things of this nature. Check out some of our other videos here on the channel. Last year, when the news broke that Elon Musk had bought Twitter, we did a video talking about could this be the end of Twitter as we know it? And the answer was yes. Shortly after he bought Twitter, it was made public that Twitter lost tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising and sponsorship revenues. And as we've all seen recently, Twitter as we know it is dead. The company is now called X. So we were right. We also did another video here in the UK regarding news and politics, where the Deputy Prime Minister at the time, Dominic Raab, was accused of bullying and aggressive behaviour within the workplace, uh, which we said did actually happen. Now, this was subject to an investigation, and if he had been found guilty, which we said he was, then he would have either been sacked or would have to resign. That's exactly what happened. We were right again. In sport, we told everyone way before the media got excited about Alejandro Garnacho, a player, a young player that Manchester United had, a new starlet on their hands. We told everyone that he was going to be the next big thing, 
way before anyone else was on those uh, coattails. So we were ahead of the curve on that one. Last year, we covered the Cristiano Ronaldo and Piers Morgan interview as it happened, giving our thoughts on the topics that were covered. And irrespective of the backs and forths between the likes of Roy Keane, Gary Neville and every other man and his dog, we explained that Manchester United would terminate his contract. And they did. And if that wasn't enough, we are the ones who told the world that Lionel Messi was going to move to the MLS, that he was going to sign for Inter Miami. We told everyone in November of last year that he was going to go to the MLS, that this was going to be the start of his decline. This was going to be his swan song move. At the time, everyone was talking about the World Cup and all the other media were talking about options to extend with PSG or possibly re-signing with Barcelona or even taking the money on offer at Saudi Arabia. But we said no. We said in November of last year, he's going to move to Inter Miami. And what happened? He moved to Inter Miami. So we told everyone six months before anyone else that this was going to happen. So if you want to know what's written in the stars, and if you want a horse to back, back Adscast. We know what we're talking about. I'm just going to give you another second to hit like and subscribe now and get ahead of the curve for any future announcements. So we can demonstrate that we know what we're talking about, that we can make these predictions and they come true. But you might be asking, what the hell do you know and why the hell should I listen to you here at Adscast? Well, it may come as a shock to you, but I don't spend all my time sitting in front of a camera here on YouTube. Just going to give you a second to pick yourself up from falling off your chair there. No, you see, in the real world, I do have a day job. And that day job is running and being involved with and doing business with companies. Companies here in the UK, companies in North America, and companies in the Middle East, specifically the GCC region. Now, you may not know what the GCC region is. Well, basically, countries in the Middle East have formed an economic coalition, not too dissimilar to what the EU used to be. And it's a means for them to do business and trade and do commercial activities, uh, but reduce the barriers of doing so. So countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, which of course includes Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Bahrain, and Qatar have formed this coalition. Actually, they've extended that because they want to do business, you know, across as wide a range of countries as possible. So that GCC actually includes countries such as Kuwait, even Iraq at times, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. Yes, those guys over there. So I've actually got extensive experience in running companies and doing business with companies in the exact geographical territories which are prevalent and related to the Manchester United sale. Founding companies and running companies here in the UK, doing the same in North America, and doing the same in the Middle East, including Qatar. So I'm uniquely positioned to be able to explain all of the intricacies and all the plates that need to be spun when a deal of this magnitude covering these geographic territories, and also when you've got both private limited companies, individuals, proxies, and publicly traded companies are all at play. Don't worry, all of that jargon will be explained. I just wanted to explain to you that I know what I'm talking about. So let's begin. So to understand what's going on with the Manchester United sale, we need to actually understand a little bit more about Manchester United as an entity before we actually get into the complexities of the sale and the ownership and all that kind of thing. Now to do that, we have to go back. Not to when the Glazers bought the club, or even before when the Glazers bought the club. We have to go way back. Way, way, way back. Manchester United was founded all the way back in 1878, except they weren't called Manchester United back then. They were called Newton Heath, named after the area in Manchester. Now, I don't want to waste too much time talking about the early years of Manchester United today, because it's not all related to what we want to talk about, but it is important to set the scene for today. Now, for their first few years, Newton Heath played at a ground called North Road. But by 1893, they'd moved to another ground called Bank Street in an area called Clayton. And by the 1890s, although they weren't founding members of the Football League, Newton Heath had applied and were now members of the Football League and were participating in the FA Cup. 
through the 1890s, they formally established themselves as a business, as well as a football club, and were being promoted and relegated between the first and second divisions of the Football League at that time. By the end of the 1890s, and at the turn of the 20th century, Newton Heath were spending more time in the first division than out of it. They had recently incorporated as a company, which enabled them to pay their players properly. And because they were spending more time in the first division and establishing themselves as a bigger club, they were able to sign more renowned footballers. But of course, this came at a cost. Their costs, their signing on fees, their salaries and wages were going up and up and up, which is standard for any club that spends more time in higher divisions. By the turn of the 20th century, 1901-1902, the club faced severe financial difficulties to the point, rumour has it, that they even faced a winding up order. Step forward John Henry Davis, a local wealthy businessman who had a penchant for investing in local sports in the Manchester area. Now depending on what rumour and story you want to believe, he came across Newton Heath, invested in them and became their owner and chairman. In 1902, he changed their name to Manchester United, and in 1908, put up the funds to build a new stadium, which opened for the 1909-10 season, which is called Old Trafford. Now, the reason for going so far back is to show that Manchester United, since the dawn that they became Manchester United, away from Newton Heath, have always been pragmatic and have had the rationale that when the time is right and the circumstances are there, they are a club that will sell. That when there is investment on the table and it's the right investment for the club, they will sell. John Henry Davis was the first man to put up significant capital, took control of the club, funded their expansion, their new stadium, and Manchester United in the early part of the 20th century, who would go on to win FA Cups and First Divisions, became what they became because of that investment. Under the stewardship of John Henry Davis, Manchester United climbed to the summit of the English game. They won two league titles and an FA Cup, but by the 1920s the Great Depression had taken hold and the club was significantly and severely affected. Unfortunately, John Henry Davis passed away in 1927. Now Manchester United has a close and historic relationship, a very close affinity with the textiles industry of Manchester. In 1931, just a few short years after the death of John Henry Davis, a wealthy industrialist from the textiles industry, a man by the name of James Gibson, bought the club in 1931 and invested large sums of money to restabilise them through the times of the Great Depression and the Second World War. So in this instance, Manchester United again showed that when the circumstances and the need was right, they welcome investment and the change of ownership happened when James Gibson bought the club. Now, this is where the close affiliation between Manchester United and the textile industry started, because James Gibson was from the textiles industry. He bought Manchester United, and for the second time in just over 20 years, Manchester United had agreed to be sold, because their need to be sold was there, and the investment was there, again showing that the rationale and the pragmatism of the club is to sell, for investment to come in, when it is the right option for the club. In terms of his legacy, James Gibson is the man who established the close affiliation between Manchester United and the Manchester textiles industry. He invested great sums of money to effectively save the club and stabilise it through times of economic hardship in the 1930s. He also hired and appointed Sir Matt Busby as the club's manager and obviously brought in Jimmy Murphy as well. He saw them win the 1948 FA Cup and as we know, and the rest is history. So Matt Busby, his investment in youth, going on to create the Busby Babes, the Manchester United style of play, creating the Manchester United way, which is revered around the world even to this day, that all comes ultimately from the money and investment from James Gibson. He's also the second large benefactor that Manchester United had as owner, again showing that when the circumstance is right, somebody who's got the right... Uh, investment ideas for the football club with the deep pockets, they will sell to these individuals. Those individuals come in, buy the club, and look to set the club on the right keel. In 1950, during the last part of the ownership of James Gibson, 
another wealthy businessman from the Manchester area, Lewis Edwards, was introduced to Sir Matt Busby. He immediately started buying a small stake in Manchester United, and following the Munich air disaster and the near passing for his close friend, during which of course Sir Matt Busby famously was read his last rites, Lewis Edwards increased his stake significantly, becoming one of the largest stakeholders in Manchester United. In 1964, Edwards became the largest single stakeholder in Manchester United, and in 1965, following the death of Gibson's successor, Harold Hardman, Edwards became owner and chairman of Manchester United. Now, Edwards's acquisition of Manchester United demonstrates another way that Manchester United sometimes conduct their sales processes. In the cases of James Gibson and John Henry Davis, they had basically rocked up with large suitcases of money, bought the club outright, and overnight had become sole owners of Manchester United. In the case of Edwards, this didn't happen. He started off buying small stakes of the club, slowly increasing his shareholding to the point that he became one of and then the largest shareholder in Manchester United. So it was much more of a slower, gradual acquisition process compared to the quicker sale process of Gibson and Davis before him. Now, at the end of it, the outcome is the same. Edwards became the largest shareholder of Manchester United, meaning he received the largest proportion of profits, and of course it meant that he also got to call the shots when he became owner and chairman, just like those who came before him. But the process involved for his acquisition was a slower, gradual increase in the buying of shares. This is a pattern that we'll see repeated almost 60 years later. So in 1965, when he had completed his acquisition, and was ultimately the owner and chairman of Manchester United, the seeds of what would lead Manchester United to become the behemoth that they are now had started to be sown. And under his stewardship, Manchester United were again champions of England and of course famously won the European Cup in 1968. In 1970, Lewis's son, Martin, who probably is looked back historically as the more famous of the Edwards dynasty at Manchester United, was voted onto the board alongside his father. His father unfortunately passed away in 1979 and Martin Edwards eventually became chairman of Manchester United in the early 1980s, continuing that Edwards association with Manchester United that had started all the way back in 1950 and now saw the second generation Edwards take the helm of the club. Now that period in the 1980s is really important for Manchester United, but also for football in general. You see, the explosive worldwide phenomenal business of the Premier League, the seeds of that were sown in the 1980s. And of course, under Martin Edwards' watch at that time, Manchester United were undergoing a huge drought in terms of winning the English First Division, as it was back then. They'd gone through Dave Sexton, they brought in Ron Atkinson, and although they won the FA Cup a couple of times... It was now getting on towards 20 years since they'd last won the first division. Now, of course, one of the great achievements and part of his legacy of Martin Edwards is the fact that he brought in Sir Alex Ferguson as manager in November 1986, at which point United were staring towards 20 years since they'd last been champions. But it's important to understand the greater economic position that was affecting not only Manchester United at the time, but English football in general. You see, in 1980s, English football was a bit strapped for cash. Unlike in North America, where the big sports were on TV all the time, huge TV audiences paying their sports stars vast sums of money, there was no football here in the UK. Now in Europe, the likes of Germany and Italy and Spain had already started to broadcast their divisions on TV. Those clubs were starting to generate more money. Also from 1985, as a result of the Heisel disaster, English clubs were banned from Europe. So that meant clubs like Manchester United or Liverpool or Everton, the big clubs who were dominating the game at the time, couldn't play at Europe's top table. So during this time, English clubs were at a double disadvantage in terms of money. Firstly, unlike on the continent, their games were not being broadcast on TV. So they didn't have the TV audience. They didn't get the TV money. They didn't command huge uh, sponsorship and advertising deals as a result of that, and they couldn't compete with their European counterparts in terms of raw money. When players such as Maradona from South America were being coveted, English clubs just simply couldn't, couldn't compete on transfer fees or on wages. So clubs in Italy, 
or clubs in Germany or clubs in Spain would land those marquee signatures instead of the clubs here. Secondly, as a result of the ban on English clubs in 1985, meaning they couldn't go into European competition, again, the revenue and the prestige that came from competing in Europe was also lost here. So what we saw is an exodus of some of the biggest stars in the league to some European rivals. Players such as Gary Lineker, Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, Graham Souness would depart for Germany, Italy or Spain. Now Martin Edwards was an industrious sort of fellow and he made the best with what he had. Manchester United became one of the cutting edge commercial enterprises within England and in Europe relative to what they could work with at that time. They investigated and explored all avenues to generate money from season tickets, from selling advertising space at Old Trafford, maximising the sort of food and alcoholic consumption that you could get at the ground. They signed deals with kit manufacturers. They signed as lucrative uh, shirt sponsorship deals that they could at the time. Anything that they could to generate as much money as they could. But still, they came up short. They didn't have the revenue from Europe. And of course, they didn't have the TV money that the European uh, clubs from the likes of Italy, Spain and Germany could command. Martin Edwards' legacy goes down really twofold. One, because of the appointment of Sir Alex Ferguson and the history thereafter. We don't need to touch on that for today. But two, because he was one of the driving forces behind the discussions that would ultimately lead to the formation of the Premier League, which of course happened at the start of the 1990s and the first season from 92-93 started and the rest is history. So Martin Edwards really started that process to turn Manchester United into a commercial gigantuum of the football world, of the sporting world. He brought in Sir Alex Ferguson and he was a driving force behind the formation of the Premier League. He also helped Manchester United explore all potential commercial avenues and transformed the club really. So his legacy, inheriting it from his father, was to turn the club into this huge commercial enterprise. Now, before all the success of Sir Alex Ferguson and the legacy that he created, and before the explosion of the Premier League as we know it now, the talks that would ultimately lead to the formation of the Premier League were protracted. And English clubs didn't have that much money to compete with their European counterparts, as I already said. In the case of Manchester United, they really wanted to generate as much money as possible, as I've already said, to fund that commercial explosion that Martin Edwards had in his vision. Step forward, Michael Knighton, a young, bullish businessman from the UK, who, although he didn't have a well-known public persona at the time, had an incredible affinity for building a network of like-minded individuals with whom he could do business. He had built his own personal wealth and he joined forces with two of Britain's best known retailers at the time to create a consortium of three people. Together, they had a bid accepted of 20 million pounds, which was by far and large a record amount of money for a football club in the English game at that time. Now, history isn't too kind to Michael Knighton. In a bit of a backfiring PR disaster, after having his bid accepted, he famously dressed himself in the Manchester United kit on the opening day of the season when they were at Old Trafford playing against the champions Arsenal, a match that they would win 4-1. He would show off his football skills doing some naff keepy-uppies and it was all a little bit of a, a joke and a bit of a PR disaster. However, Michael Knighton was extremely astute at formulating cast iron business plans and it was his template that would lay the scene and the seeds for future takeovers of Manchester United but also the strategy that Manchester United themselves would employ to become the largest sports company in the world. You see Michael Knighton understood the untapped potential within Manchester United and within football as a whole at the time and it was his strategy of trying to merchandise the hell out of the football club that United would become famous for in the 90s, which kind of set the foundations for how Manchester United would explode. You see, he wanted replica shirts. He wanted mouse mats for computers, which were just taking off at the time. He wanted stationary sets. He wanted lunch boxes. He wanted every young fan up and down the land to be dressed head to toe in Manchester United gear. He saw that potential. Now, unfortunately, his backers got cold feet and a month or so after that deal was agreed, they pulled out and the deal collapsed. And 
although they'd agreed a 20 million pound takeover he was paid a different amount of money and accepted a seat on the board however he'd already lodged his strategy to the likes of martin edwards and the board prior to having his bid accepted and the board understood what potential lay in that strategy and they effectively stole it and implemented it now of course no one could know how the premier league was going to explode but from the early days of the league its popularity the fact it was being broadcast here in the uk on sky meant a whole new audience and a whole new untapped revenue stream grew almost overnight off the back of that manchester united's strategy that michael knighton had developed saw them become the biggest club in england europe and the world that commercial strategy is what is now being copied by other clubs the world over so although history is unkind to michael knighton that strategy which united implemented very well saw them become the world's biggest sports company almost overnight but also the fact that he founded a proxy company don't worry we'll cover that terminology later for the purposes of buying manchester united and the way that he put his bid forward and it was with a coalition of people laid the foundations for how future acquisitions of manchester united would also come to fruition so in the 1990s the premier league has exploded the revenue potential that is now being seen by the clubs is beyond their wildest dreams manchester united are riding the crest of a wave right now they are at the top of the english game they reach the summit of europe they're winning premier leagues they're winning fa cups they win the champions league and of course the famous treble of 1999 they are becoming the biggest sports team in the world with record revenues record fan base record merchandise sales record profits following michael knight and strategy to the t they are growing probably larger than anyone could have foreseen but at the end of that decade the broadcaster here within the uk sky who had the rights to show the premier league games here for the uk had a bid accepted to buy manchester united outright now depending on which story you want to believe that bid was worth as much as one billion pounds which would have made manchester united even then the biggest and most valuable and most expensive sports commodity in the world now that bid was accepted by manchester united and the board and the only reason that acquisition didn't happen is because it was blocked by the government here in the uk there is a watchdog that covers various markets and they said it would create a monopoly which cannot be allowed and a conflict of interest that cannot be allowed that the broadcaster who is broadcasting all 20 clubs within the premier league can't be allowed to own one of the clubs within the premier league so the acquisition the whole sales process was blocked by the government here but again it shows manchester united when the opportunity arises when somebody or a company with big pockets comes forward and it's the right amount of money manchester united at the end of the 1990s beginning of the 2000s as they had done in the 1960s as they had done in the 1950s and at the turn of the 20th century before it they are a selling club so the deal fell through manchester united floated on the stock exchange again we will cover this later we're just setting the scene so they float on the stock exchange and instead of becoming a privately limited company where individuals or other companies come and just buy shares from those who already own the company they are now floated on the stock market and you can buy shares and buy and trade them as you would with any other publicly traded company and the ownership of manchester united at this point changes whereas the edwards family had almost had exclusive control of the club largest shareholder and whatnot now you had to buy the shares publicly and over some time uh, two irish racehorse entrepreneurs by the name of john magnia and jp mcmanus ended up becoming the two largest uh, shareholders of manchester united in 2002 martin edwards left manchester united bringing an end of an association of the club which had stretched 72 years when his father had first invested in the club but by this point united are more than just a football club more than just a business they became the first publicly traded football club in the world and their value continued to skyrocket so all of that kind of brings us to where we were at the time that the glazers took over manchester united 
a football club that had been established for 125 years or more at that point and had gone through several acquisitions showing a history and a trend that as a board it doesn't matter who's in the hot seat at the time manchester united are open and willing to sell and receive external investment and in the mid 2000s they're a publicly traded company arguably the biggest sports company in the world they just sat there ready for somebody to come along and buy it one of the biggest misconceptions about this entire saga is the way that the glazers are portrayed as almost like pantomime villains and that's not quite correct so we need to establish the history and structure of how they bought manchester united in the first place so that we can then accurately explain how this process is going and will continue to run so the glazers contrary to all belief didn't just pluck Manchester United out of thin air and they didn't just on a whim go and buy shares from Manchester United so let's explain exactly how that process worked so the Glazers although they are actually real people are not behaving and operating like real people they're actually operating through companies so Malcolm Glazer who was the orchestrator of this acquisition as far back as 2003 was doing so through a company or companies which he'd actually inherited from his father their main source of revenue and growth was through real estate shopping malls and retail space and flipping properties and that kind of thing they were a multi multi billion dollar business and Malcolm Glazer was a billionaire it's important to remember that although he's extremely wealthy all of this is being done through his companies so we're going to call the glazers glazers inc short for incorporated which is a similar uh, explanation for how a company is structured in the united states and other parts of the world as we have here in the uk where we use limited or ltd now we don't need to worry too much about those letters right now we'll talk about company formation and structure later but the important thing is we need to get away from thinking of the glazers as people we need to think about the glazers as a company or group of companies the glazer acquisition process of manchester united started as far back as 2003. now we've already established that manchester united was a publicly traded company at that point in time a plc so that meant if you had a broker or a trading platform or access through a bank anyone through the stock exchange can buy and sell Manchester United shares the two largest shareholders at the time of Manchester United were Irish racehorse entrepreneurs John Magnier and JP McManus now we'll go into publicly traded companies shortly but remember we've already established that Manchester United are floated on the stock market right now now the way that a publicly traded company works is you have a value of that company whatever it is let's call it a million dollars and what we do is we split that company virtually so we don't physically cut it up we virtually split it into items of value of that company which we call shares so if i've got a company worth a million dollars because my revenue or my profit or my customer base or whatever allows me to value that company a million dollars i can virtually split this company up into one million pieces and each of those pieces or shares is worth one dollar so when I float on the stock market and I have a value which we call a market capitalization of a million dollars and I make it known that there are a million shares available those shares can be bought and sold for a dollar each which if you buy all of those shares for 100% ownership means you've got that million dollar asset you have bought all the shares for a company worth a million dollars that's a very crude uh, way to explain how a company traded on the stock market works without getting on into all the intricacies and variables and, and what have you now the way that a public company works is it's a, it's, it's a little bit complicated and it can also be a, a tad frustrating you see if I own the company myself if it's a privately owned company and I own all the shares the same virtual million shares but I own them all if I'm looking for somebody to give me some money so that I can invest in things employ new staff buy new machinery maybe implement some new strategies whatever it is I need money to be able to do that so I might go to 
investors. Now you can have angel investors who don't really want to get too involved, they just want to make a return for uh, whatever they give you. Or you can go to some more solid investors who in return for that, not only do they want a percentage, they want to make some profit, they also want to take a slice of your pie, they want to become part owners of your company. So in a privately owned company that's a slightly easier process if you want money you can go around find the right person who's got the right amount of money negotiate favorable terms get that investment which we call capital when we can then do what we want with it we can put our strategy into place employ the people buy the stock buy the plant take over the world publicly traded companies are a little bit different unless you already own some of those shares and you're prepared to put more money into the company to find external sources is a little bit more difficult you need people to actively be buying your shares at higher prices or for you to make more shares available for other people to come and join that party for you to raise money so if i've got my million pound company and it's split virtually a million ways so there's a million shares available and each share is worth a dollar if they've already been bought up on the stock market we've got a problem unless people are looking to actively trade those shares we're not getting any additional money into the company any additional capital so unless we're selling and generating extra revenue the company doesn't have any more money at its dis uh, disposal to go and do anything so either we go and get a loan or we try and find other ways to get that capital so potentially we can release more shares valued at whatever value to try and get more people to come and buy those shares to generate some capital now at the time that the glazers started this process manchester united the edwards family had now left the club peter kenyon had become their chief executive he then left to join chelsea david gill became the new chairman ceo of manchester united and as we know they were a huge commercial entity, but they wanted more. They were looking for more investment, whether it's to buy players, whether it was to increase Old Trafford's capacity, whatever they wanted to do, they needed money. They were exploring options. Now, the Glazers weren't stupid. You see, through their companies, because they were into a number of industries, they had their ears close to the ground. Malcolm wanted to buy a football club. His sons, Joel and Avram, wanted to buy a football club. And it didn't take long for them to hear that Manchester United were looking for investment. So what we had here in 2003 was a perfect storm. We've got American investors who are actively looking to buy a football club from Europe. The most attractive and sought after that they could possibly find is Manchester United. You've got Manchester United, the most sought after and well known, possibly the largest sporting club in the world, actively looking for new investors. What is the easiest way to invest? on the stock market how are manchester united currently floated on the stock market so it's almost as if it was an inevitable you've got the biggest football club in the world which is floated on the stock market looking for new investment you've got american investors who are looking for the most renowned and sought after club they can possibly buy with the lowest barrier the lowest threshold to buying it it's manchester united now here is where the intricacies start to happen and this is why it's important, as I said earlier, to stop thinking about the Glazers as people, emotive people with some form of ulterior motive. And we need to think about the Glazers as a company or group of companies. That's why I say, forget about what they're called. Let's call them Glazers Inc. So Glazers Inc. was made up of Malcolm Glazer and his children. They want to go and they want to acquire a football club. Manchester United, although we know them on the pitch, are actually called Manchester United PLC. This is the trading name, the publicly traded name, which represents the business which owns Manchester United, the football club. There are millions and millions of shares available, and they each have a price, which gives Manchester United a total value, which in 2003 was somewhere between 750 and 800 million sterling. So what happened was... The Glazers, through whatever trading platform, broker or bank that they were using, wanted to start buying shares in Manchester United because there's a very, very low barrier to doing that. The shares are advertised at a certain price. And if you can buy a certain number of shares, you start to build your wealth, your ownership, your stakeholding in Manchester United. Now, there are a number of regulations 
which are involved here depending on how a company is structured and where they're located. Now generally speaking you can buy shares in any company which is floated on any stock market anywhere in the world. Here in the UK there's almost no barrier for you buying shares on any scale of a company which is floated here which is on the London Stock Exchange. There's almost now no barriers to you doing the same to a company which is floated say on the New York Stock Exchange or in Germany in the Frankfurt Stock Exchange provided you have the right route to market the right representation and of course the money to do so. Now there are regulations when it comes to the public buying of shares depending on the amount and thresholds that you potentially would go past where you have to start notifying people, the management, potentially have meetings about your intentions and long-term planning. But when you start small, very small, you're actually free to pretty much come and go as you please. In the September of 2003, this same red football UK-based company, owned by Malcolm Glazer, bought a small percentage of additional shares, which put their ownership at somewhere around 3.2% of Manchester United at that point in time. Now remember, if we take a pause, a, a publicly traded company can release as many shares as it wants, because these shares are virtual. You can start with one share, grow it to 100 shares, make it a million shares, make it 100 million shares. You can always release more shares if you're looking to uh, receive more capital income. So we don't know at that point in time if United had done that or if they were just buying more of the already existing publicly traded shares. But the important thing was in September of 2003, they now owned more than 3% of Manchester United. And that meant publicly they had to identify themselves not just as the local based UK registered company Red Football that they had created, but the ultimate owners. And that's where Malcolm Glazer had to formally say, Hi, I'm Malcolm Glazer. I was interested in buying a football club. I saw that Manchester United is on the stock exchange. I heard that Manchester United were looking for some investment. I've bought a little over 3% of the football club. Here I am. At this specific point in time, there aren't any major alarm bells. It's not uncommon for foreign investors who are dabbling with intentions of where and how they might want to invest in overseas markets to buy small amounts of shares and stocks in overseas companies. And when they go over a certain threshold to identify themselves and potentially have some subsequent conversations, this is actually quite common practice. What happened shortly thereafter through the remainder of that year in the October and November of 2003 is the Glazers, again through their Red Football Ventures UK-based company that they'd set up, bought more shares, taking their ownership to somewhere around 9% and then later somewhere around 15%. That is quite unusual. Now, when you start getting towards 10% ownership of a company, you don't do that by accident. You're either looking to reap the rewards of that company or you're looking to do something where you might want to think about more than just taking profit. You might want to start to affect the directional change of that company, i.e. maybe take it over. By the November of 2003, it was reported that 15% of all the available shares that were being traded under Manchester United PLC had now been bought by this Red Football Ventures group, i.e. Malcolm Glazer. At this point, he met with David Gill and the club's management to discuss what his intentions were, as speculation started that United might be about to be taken over by the Glazers or others. So it's important to stress that at no point did we know 100% that they were going to buy the football club yet. It might be that others were rumoured to be putting in a bid and they were just trying to protect their position now, for a few months following the meeting with David Gill, which we believe happened towards the end of 2003, nothing really happened. You still had the Irish guys who owned a significant amount of Manchester United. You had many, many other people who owned shares and you had the Glazers set at around 15%. What happened in the February of 2004 was they bought some more shares, taking their percentage up towards 16%. 18%. They were now in the top three or four single largest owners of Manchester United. That is where the takeover talk really started. And although a lot of this was done through anonymity, there were rumours 
that they had instructed some European and American banks to explore the possibility of a takeover. Now, it's important to remember the structure of Manchester United here. You can agree to buy shares at a fixed price to increase your stakeholding. That's easy. That's how a publicly traded company works. When it comes to launching a takeover bid, that's where you start negotiating with some of those individual larger stakeholders. And what happens is when somebody, and a single individual, that doesn't just mean John Smith, it means a company as well, owns more than 30% of a publicly traded company, they are then obliged to enter into negotiations to buy that publicly traded company. Now that's important on two counts. One, because at this point in time, the Glazers didn't own 30%. They were not obliged to do that. And two, because of the ownership model of Manchester United, now the Glazers have more than 30% of Manchester United ownership outside of their control. So this is where those rules and regulations start to impact speed and processes and the whole process thereafter. By July of 2004, the Glazers, through their Red Football Ventures UK-based company, owned around 19% of all available publicly traded shares of Manchester United. Now, this made them outright the third largest shareholder of Manchester United. It was a move that means one of two things. They're either planning a takeover or they're looking to defend against somebody else who might be looking to launch a takeover. Now, the other shareholders that I referred to before, the Irish racehorsing entrepreneurs, very specifically owned by themselves less than 30% of Manchester United, meaning they were not obliged to launch any takeover bids themselves. So if anyone else was coming in from left field, they would have to buy swathes of other shares to incrementally get to that 30% threshold. But the Glazers were the most aggressive and active party, now that we knew who they were, buying shares in Manchester United. By the middle of 2005, through their UK registered company, the Red Football Venture Group, they had continued to buy more and more shares. They bought out the largest three remaining shareholders of Manchester United, which gave them something like 74.8% of United shares. Now, that is not uh, an accident. That is actually, again, strategic. When you buy 75% shares of a publicly traded company, you're then given the option to delist the company. You take it off the stock exchange and it becomes a privately limited company again. And the entity that owns 75% or more shares is put as the largest shareholder, effectively the beneficial owner. And then you can potentially have other directors or persons of significant control. Again, these are terms that we will come to shortly. But it was important that the Glazers at this point in time, through their Red Football Venture Group, owned just a smidge under 75% of the publicly traded shares. United as an operation remained a publicly limited company, and anyone else who owned the remaining 26-27% as yet weren't being forced to sell. So they didn't technically own Manchester United in full yet, and they hadn't delisted it. But the moment they go above 75% ownership of a publicly limited company, that is when you have the ability to take it off the stock market and turn it back into a limited company again. Now, if we pause our history lesson for one second and just look at Manchester United now, again, we will revisit this shortly, we can see that the Glazers own just under 70% of the club as it stands. Again, extremely important because if you were to buy them out tomorrow, you are buying 69% ownership of the football club and the remaining splits stay as they are. So again, when we look at history repeating itself and setting precedents, and looking at rules and regulations, it's important to understand this because what you can do, what you can't do, what you're obliged to do, is affected by how much you're buying based on your transactions. In this history lesson, the Glazers owned just under 75% of Manchester United. The moment they go over it, they would be obliged to continue their purchase to buy 100% and also delist it, if they so chose, from the stock exchange, turning it back into a limited company again. 
Now, of course, we know how history panned out. By the end of 2005, they'd bought pretty much every single share there was. It was like 99.8%. The club was valued at about 800 million pounds. The rest is history. They've become the owners for, as it stands, 18 years and counting. But of course, it's only after the acquisition happened that we found out just how crazy an acquisition it was. You see, whenever you're making a large acquisition like this and you've got banks and lenders and brokers and these intermediaries involved, it's always, how can we put this, a little bit delicate. Now, what came to light was that the Glazers used borrowed money to buy Manchester United. They did what's called leveraging the banks. Now, you might, as a fan, go, well, this is terrible. And to a certain degree, you're right. But from a business pers perspective, it's exactly the strategy that you would employ. You see, if you can buy things based on borrowed money, your liability in terms of what you can be taxed on is affected in an advantageous way for you as the borrower. If I've got a company which turns over a million dollars, but I've got debt worth 500,000 and my profit is only 200,000, then I'm not taxed on any of my profits or other taxes that might be levied on me because I've still got to satisfy my debts. So if I want to buy something rather extravagant, let's say a car for $200,000, it would make sense for me to do that on borrowed money and offset it if I'm doing it through a company because I've got this very expensive thing that I need to satisfy the debt for and not a very expensive asset that I can be taxed on. So the Glazers were extremely cute. They had this extremely expensive toy that they want to buy, Manchester United. They're doing it through a locally registered company, this Red Football Ventures Limited, and they're doing it on borrowed money meaning that any profit that they make can be offset against the huge amount of debt that they've got to satisfy. It's actually an extremely clever move from their part. And of course, you don't have to fund it yourself. You don't have to put your hand in your pocket and find 800 million pounds because you're doing it through borrowed money. Let's set an example. Let's say you or I, as an individual, want to go and buy a car. Let's say it's $100,000, and for the sake of this example, we're going to ignore any form of finance other than a loan. So we go to the dealership, and we say, Hi, Mr. Dealer, I want to buy that car. It's $100,000. I'd like a $100,000 loan, please. Or you go to the bank, or wherever it is you get your money from, and you ask for a $100,000 loan. Now, normally they would ask for a down payment, but we're going to ignore that for this specific example. So it's a straight up $100,000 loan to go and buy that car. Now, of course, they're going to charge interest. So at the end of the term of that loan, we won't pay back $100,000. It'll probably be $120,000, $130,000, maybe even $150,000 at the end of it. But it doesn't matter. We've got our loan. We want to go and buy that asset. Now, other than signing the form, there are a few things which would be asked of us that we have to prove. The first thing is we have to prove some form of proof of funds. We have to show through bank accounts that we aren't broke. We have to show we have some form of money against our name. We have to show that we've got employment. We have to prove our salary. So we're going to have to submit bank statements, possibly even covering letters from our employer, to show that we earn a certain amount of money that allows them to assess affordability. Can you realistically afford the repayment instalments over the course of this loan? Otherwise, we're not going to give you the money. So that's the first thing that everyone has to do. The second thing is you normally need to provide some form of security. Now, that security can be by way of other assets, such as multiple vehicles you might already own. More commonly, it's through property. They'll probably want to put what's called a charge on your property that states if you default on your loan, if you miss repayments or if they choose to terminate it, they can potentially look to take ownership of your property, sell it, and take the amount that is required to cover the cost of that loan in the event that you don't pay. They may also require you to sign something called a personal guarantee, which is in the event that you terminate the loan, and in addition or alongside any securities that they ask for, you, through that proof of funds and the salary that you've got or any savings in the bank, agree to pay the money back personally. Now, sometimes those things can run uh, coincidentally, 
but in parallel, side by side, sometimes the securities clause will, will take precedent. But basically, you're having to not sign your life away, but you really need to make it almost as fail-safe for the lender as you possibly can. Now, if this was a business transaction, a business loan, so again, look, you or I, we have a business called 123 Incorporated or 123 Limited. We want to go and buy that vehicle, $100,000 truck or van for our business. So we go to the dealership, we go to the bank, we ask for that $100,000 loan. We have to do the same thing. So we normally have to provide one, three or five years worth of accounts to show the trading history of the business. What's the revenue? What's the profit and loss? What's the gross margin? What's the business plan? What's the trajectory? Again, they want to make sure that the business is in a position that it will be able to repay those repayment amounts over the course of the loan. You'll typically have to sign a personal guarantee as a director or a person of significant control. Somebody associated with that business could be multiple directors, which states in the event of a, of a default or a termination, you have to pay that money back. You may also, in addition to that, have to provide securities, which could be if the business owns numerous assets, machinery, its own premises, possibly even your own personal property, you might have to sign those over to the lender where they put a charge on that, where they can potentially appoint someone to take ownership of those assets, sell them off and to satisfy the loan. Now, for anyone who's ever unfortunately in these times had to go through credit applications, loans and that kind of thing, what I've just explained there probably makes a lot of sense. It's probably something you've seen many times over. You can't just go and take money willy nilly. They need you to prove you can afford it. They probably want you to sign guarantees, securities, that kind of thing. That's pretty standard. However, in the case of buying Manchester United, when the Glazers went to borrow money, they were able to exploit a loophole. You see, they didn't actually put any of their own money up to buy Manchester United. They effectively went to the banks and said, we want to buy that really expensive shiny toy over there. It's going to cost about £800 million. Can you lend us the money? By the way, we're not going to put a down payment down. The bank said, OK, but it's going to cost you a lot of money, possibly as much as £15 to £20 million a year just on the interest repayments. And the Glazers were fine with that. So that's what you or I, either as an individual or a business, would also do. We go to the lender, we explain we want to buy something very expensive, they tell us what the repayments are going to look like, we go, okay. The Glazer's main company, as I said before, is in real estate. It was generating revenues of 10 plus billion dollars a year, there or thereabouts. They could more than afford those repayments. The banks were like, okay, we'll lend you the money, you can clearly afford it. But here's where the loophole kicked in. In the event that you or I went and loaned money to get the, the, the vehicle that we wanted, we or our businesses are responsible for making those repayments. The liability is on us. And if we don't make those repayments, we could potentially be in default. And they can come and take our property or our assets to satisfy the loan. What happened with the Glazers? was the greatest yarn spin ever. They said to the banks, fine, we accept that we're going to have to make huge uh, interest repayments, not a problem, but the debt's going to be leveraged on the very thing that we're going to buy. The liability is going to sit with them. The repayments are going to come from them. And if a default situation happens, it's not going to affect us. We're going to put that asset that we're buying up as the security. Now just think about that for one second. Imagine if you went to a bank to buy a car and you said it's $100,000, it's probably going to cost you $150,000 at the end by the time you finish that loan. But instead of the liability sitting on you or the liability sitting on your property, I want the liability to sit on the car. The car is going to make its own repayments to pay off the loan. And if it doesn't, you can take possession of the car. Despite the fact the car potentially could depreciate in value over the lifetime of the loan. Now, most banks would tell you where to where to go. They'd probably tell you to. But in this scenario, the banks looked at this and approved it. So just take that for one second. Just consider it. And the Glazers, through their business, yes, they generate huge amounts of money. So affording the loan is not a problem. They go to the banks and they say, we accept the terms of the loan. But the liability will not sit on our company. The liability will sit on the asset that we're buying that business over there. 
the repayments for the loan that we're taking out will come from that business over there, not us. If a scenario exists where that business that we're borrowing money to buy doesn't make its own repayments, you can take repossession of that. It's training ground. It's stadium. Potentially sell players to make payments. But we're going to walk away scot-free. Now, this is unheard of. And I should also point out, subsequently has become illegal. It's only the fact that Manchester United are such a big entity, generating record revenues, that such a liability was allowed to stand and was sustainable. So Manchester United is sitting there on the stock exchange, buying the likes of Ruud van Nistelrooy, Juan Sebastian Veron, competing for the Champions League, winning Premier Leagues. Along come the Glazers. They buy Manchester United on borrowed money and put the liability onto the very thing that they are buying. It didn't ask to be bought, but it's now lumped having to make annual repayment amounts to satisfy a debt it didn't sign up to. This is crazy. And if they don't make those repayment amounts, their assets, the stadium, the players, the training ground could be sold off to repay a loan that they didn't take out. So in our scenario, when we go and buy a car, the car doesn't ask to be bought. The car doesn't ask to be going into debt. The car will also depreciate the moment you drive it off the forecourt. And for every mile that you drive, its value will go down. But we go and get our loan. We put that loan on the car. The car becomes responsible for paying back our loan. And despite normally having to provide securities or a personal guarantee, we're not going to do that. You just take the car. No such agreement exists in our real worlds. And fortunately, no such agreement can exist again in the football world because they've now realized the authorities, FIFA, UEFA, the FA, various commissions here under the UK government have realized that such a way of doing business jeopardizes the future of the very thing that's being bought. So Manchester United fans have been doubly kicked in the stomach. They were bought by an entity that they didn't want, as the Glazers, through their Red Football Ventures group, were buying shares. Manchester United fans were protesting. They didn't want them as owners. The ownership came to pass anyway, and the acquisition was done on borrowed money. Borrowed money. So unlike Roman Abramovich, or unlike Sheikh Mansour, of Manchester City, who put their own money forward into buying and investing into the football club, Manchester United were bought on borrowed money. The debt was then put onto Manchester United, not onto the companies that the Glazers had incorporated, which is highly irregular. United were now lumped by making these repayments, and if they didn't, Manchester United would be the entity that would suffer. To make matters worse, over the following 18 years, the Glazers have been taking huge dividend payments, which could be anything in the region of one to two billion pounds sterling, and have not been investing capital money in Manchester United. Any times that Manchester United have had to buy players or reinvest in its infrastructure, it's had to do so through its own means, i.e. the revenue it generates, or if the Glazers sell off part of the club to get additional capital. So you might be wondering, how does the Manchester United ownership model look? Well, as I said before, it's important to remember that the Glazers in this instance aren't people, they're companies. So in America, you've got their first alliance company. This is their multi, multi-billion dollar company, which is where they get all their money from. In the UK, they've established numerous proxy companies, companies which don't serve any other purpose other than to be a holding company for activities. They've got Red Football Limited, which is what they use to buy Manchester United. That's owned by Red Football Joint Venture Limited, which in turn is owned by Red Football Shareholder Limited, all of whom had Malcolm Glazer as their owner, and since he unfortunately passed away, his children have now inherited all of his shares in an equal split. Owning all of those UK proxies is another proxy, another holding company in the United States, which recently was relocated to Delaware, 
which is famous in the United States for its anonymity. It doesn't have to file in-depth company accounts and it doesn't need to disclose who the owners are. So in terms of the Manchester United ownership model, you would be forgiven for thinking that the Glazers therefore own it all, all 100% of Manchester United. After all, they bought all the shares, they delisted it from the stock market, they must be the only owners, right? Well, because they don't want to put their hand in their pocket and invest in anything, the Glazers need to find sources of money in order to satisfy the demands of running a football club, the everyday maintenance, for example, on the stadium, if they need to make upgrades to the training pitch, if they have to go and buy players. And that's before taking things like COVID and rising inflationary costs into account. If you want to maintain a football club, you've got to put more and more money into it. They don't want to do that. So they need to find investment. They need capital. So within the last 18 years of their ownership, they've done a couple of different things. The first thing they did was to refinance all their debt. Now, bear in mind that they had to borrow almost £800 million in the first place. By refinancing it, they've been able to do things like payment holidays and restructure the payments themselves to repay some of that interest, which can fluctuate between 15 to £20 million a year. By refinancing, they can bring some of those annual repayment costs down. That releases a little bit more money for maintenance, upkeep and player sales. The other thing that they've done is they've actually sold part of the company through a number of processes in the last 18 years. The first major thing they did when they were looking for capital investment was they did what's called a stock offering. They basically took an amount of the club that they were prepared to let go and allowed private individuals to buy the club. Now, bearing in mind, they delisted it from the stock market when they bought the club in 2005. It was now a limited company, privately owned, that the Glazers, through all their proxy companies, of which we've said there's quite a few, they can do what they want with. If somebody who has got deep pockets wants to invest in the club, the Glazers are completely free to cut off a piece of that pie for an agreed amount of money to bring that investor into the club. What they did is they did this through the Singapore Stock Exchange. They did a bond share offering, which allowed them to take segments of the club's ownership, a percentage, two percentage, three percentage, whatever it might be. And some wealthy benefactors, most of whom have anonymity, we don't know who they are, have bought chunks of Manchester United. So over the years, when United have had to raise vast sums of money, for example, when they went on a spending spree, buying the likes of Angel Di Maria for 60 million, or Harry Maguire for 80 million, or Paul Pogba for basically 90 million, a lot of that was done through this bond issue. And what that does is it brings the ownership of Manchester United that the Glazers have down, and it brings other investors in. It means that when Manchester United are making money and they give money off as a dividend payment, the Glazers take a percentage, 90, 95, whatever it is, and the remaining is spread amongst the other investors that have bought that bond issue. The other thing that the Glazers chose to do, latterly, to raise capital, was to float part of Manchester United back onto the stock exchange. Now, remember what I said very early doors in the video. If you've got a company which is worth a certain amount of money, let's say a million dollars, and you make a million shares available of that company, each would be worth one dollar. You buy all those million shares, you own a million dollar company. The other thing that you can do when you want to float on the company is you can determine how much of that company you want to float. So if we had a million dollar company, and we wanted to float 20% of that, but still have a million shares. The shares, even if we buy them all, would only give us 20% ownership of the company. That means all shares combined would only come to $200,000 each, which lowers the value of the share, because you're only going to own a percentage of the club, even if you buy all the shares. So where we are present day, is the Glazers have slowly, slowly sold more and more of their shares to some private investors, and they've allowed more and more of the club to be floated on the stock exchange. The Glazers now own 69% of the company for themselves. 
they've floated somewhere in the region of 18 to 20 percent of the company on the stock exchange and the remaining percentage which is a little over 10 percent is owned by private investors now this is important in a multitude of ways if you buy all of the shares on the stock market you'll ultimately only ever own a maximum percentage of manchester united somewhere in the region of 18 to 20 percent it doesn't matter how many shares are there available one share, 10 shares, a million shares, or a billion shares. And it doesn't matter what the share price is floating at, because even if you bought them all tomorrow, you will only own a very fixed percentage of Manchester United, which is below any international thresholds obliging you or requiring you to make and take over offer. Remember, if we go back earlier in the video, we need to get to a position of 30% or more from a publicly traded company in order to be obliged to buy it. Therefore, if you were to buy all the shares, you wouldn't get more than 20% of the company. So you're never going to acquire it per se. The remaining percentage is owned by other private investors. Now, you'd have to privately negotiate with them to uh, agree a price that they would want to sell to. But again, you'd be capped at just over 10% ownership of the club. So the Glazers own 69% of the Manchester United pie and they've capped the ownership despite giving that capital injection in return. They've capped the ownership that the other parties have in return. Okay, so where we are now is we understand how Manchester United is owned. We understand the percentage the Glazers own, which is 69%. We understand that all the way through its history, United is a club that has been open and has been sold multiple times. We know that in 2005, the Glazers bought public shares, delisted the company. We know now that they've partly relisted the company and they've sold some other shares to some private investors. And they're left with 69% outright ownership of Manchester United. But if we thought that was complicated, we've only just scratched the surface of this iceberg. So we need to go deeper. And to do that, we need to go to the very start of this food chain. The start of this food chain is the ultimate company which sits at the top of all of those red football limited companies that I told you about earlier in the video. And this is a company that was based in Delaware in the United States. It's now moved to the Cayman Islands. Now, anyone watching this in North America will know everything about the Cayman Islands, what they're notorious for. Anyone watching in Europe may be less familiar. So let's explain. The Cayman Islands are a set of islands. They're based in the Caribbean. They're known as a tax haven. It means they don't charge any tax, income tax or tax on company profits, which is great for investors and directors. And it's a bit of a tax haven, really. But the other thing which is important to note is the anonymity that the Cayman Islands provide. You can establish a company there and file minimal or almost non-existent accounts. You don't have to disclose the turnover, the profit or the loss or the liabilities of a company. And you don't have to disclose the shareholders or the directors. This means you can have assets, own property and be involved in companies without disclosing your identity. Now, although there's been a lot of hoo-ha in the news about this, and it is being cracked on more and more, nothing actually illegal about it provides you're not breaking the law. You just don't necessarily want to file detailed accounts or report on all of your activities. So as long as you're not breaking the law, filing a company in somewhere like the Cayman Islands isn't actually illegal. Now, the company in the Cayman Islands is the ultimate parent company of all of this. It is the company basically that Malcolm Glazer set up to start his acquisition of Manchester United. We're going to call this company Glazer's Inc. Glazer's Incorporated. It doesn't actually matter what it's called, but just think of it as this piece of a pie, this whole encompassing thing, the umbrella, the parent company. It's ultimately what owns Manchester United. Now, in any business, whether it's a publicly traded company, a privately traded company, or a partnership or similar. You have what's called a charter. Now this charter denotes who the directors are, it denotes their shareholding, it denotes company secretaries, it denotes anyone who's got any sort of significant control, whether they have direct shares and stocks, or whether they are just given some form of uh, non-monetary shares, but can affect the direction of the company. 
basically anyone and everyone who's going to affect how the company is going to operate and what direction it's going to go in are put on this charter. Now this charter is a bit like the agreement in the United Nations. Now the United Nations is the coming together of pretty much every nation on earth. 200, 220, 240 countries, whatever it is. But there are some countries who are reserved some historic additional powers. Some of the historic superpowers were given some additional powers. So although everyone's equal and everyone has an, a voice that can be heard, when a motion, which is something which should be debated and discussed, is put forward in the United Nations, there are some nations who have the power to veto it, which basically means they can sit there and go, yep, don't want it, it's not happening. And that's the end of that. And those countries include China, the United States, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Now, there are some other nations who've also got a little bit of extra sway, such as Japan and Germany as well. But that core group of those five permanent members that I just listed have slightly elevated status and the ability to veto motions. So if we we're going to discuss an agreement on trade or stopping a war or whatever it might be, these countries can, in theory, just say, nah, that's the end of that. Now, a charter for a company can operate in the same way. You might have an equal shareholding, but some people might have additional powers, additional sway, and that would be recorded in such a charter. Now, when Malcolm Glazer passed away, it is assumed, and I must state, assumed, that all of his children have inherited an identical equal split in terms of a monetary amount and a power amount of his companies. Now, he has six children. We assume, therefore, that they have an equal split, which will come up to 100%. And we also assume that each one of them has got a one-sixth voting right, which, if it does carry preferential status or the veto status, that carries for all of them. Now, the reason I say assumed is that's extremely important. No one has ever seen this charter. No one knows what the formation of these companies look like, and nobody knows if any of the siblings hold more sway than the others. You see, if you've got 100% of a company split six ways, it works out at a little bit more than 16.5% each, which is great. So if we make a million dollars, we each get to split that six ways. So just over $166,000. But also more importantly is the voting rights that you have. Who has more control and sway over the direction of the company? Because that could potentially affect future earnings as well. So it's not just about money. It's about power. Manchester United fans will tell you that the two out of the six siblings that are seen more frequently at Old Trafford and at Manchester United events are Joel and Avram Glazer. But does that mean that they've got more sway or they're just more emotionally invested in Manchester United? We don't know. The other thing that we don't know is when it comes to voting, what does that charter look like? You see, what's quite common in these kind of scenarios is a mandate or a motion can be put forward which is debated amongst directors and shareholders at these extraordinary meetings or annual meetings that they have. And what will happen is for a motion to pass, it usually needs to carry a weighting voting in favour of it. Now, normally, this would come, say, 51% or a two-thirds or a three-quarters majority, but it might also be unanimous. Now, an example of this could be, we have six members of this board, so we are led to believe which are the six siblings. It might be that you only need a 4-2 split in favour of a motion for that to pass, but it might also be that you need to have all six vote in favour of it. We just don't know. You see, in the Premier League, you have 20 teams in any given season. The three teams that are relegated have to resign from the Premier League, and the three teams that are promoted are appointed into the Premier League. The Premier League, when it agrees anything from a central perspective, such as TV rights and other advertising, sponsorship and alike, splits everything 20 ways. Every team gets one twentieth of the money, and every team is given one vote when they are debating you know, significant motions. When they are looking to make an agreement on something, all 20 clubs have to vote together. Now that's fantastic democracy. What we don't know here with the Glazers 
is this company charter, which is fundamental to everything they do. We don't know what it says. Would a two thirds or a three quarters or a five one split be sufficient? Or must all six siblings be unanimous in voting for or against a particular motion? We also don't know if, when he passed, Malcolm Glazer appointed any close confidants into this executive committee. We don't know if any of the Glazer siblings have pro proposed or approved anyone else to join their closed group. We can only assume that all of these decisions are done from those six siblings. We also assume, given the amount of time this has taken, that it must be unanimous. There are mumblings that Joel and Avram are the ones who are stalling because potentially they don't want to let go of Manchester United. They see potential revenue streams and growth, which they don't want to forego. So that would add weight to the argument, potentially, that whatever decision they come to, it must be unanimous. And this is important because this could be the crux of why we're seeing delay. Now, that's quite a lot of information to take in in a short space of time. So let me try and scale this right back and explain some basics. So we're talking about a company and a company structure. We're talking about different types of company structures here as well. For most of its existence, Manchester United has been what's called a private limited company. So its existence, its bricks, its mortar has been owned by someone. So let's strip this right back to basics. So here we have a company bricks, mortar, employees, sales, whatever you want. That company has to be owned by someone. Now, in a simple scenario, let's say it's owned by one person. They will have a charter, they'll have a hierarchy denoting the ownership structure. Mr. Smith owns this company. He has one share valued at $1. He owns 100% of the company. So the company charter is a very simple one. Here is one, two, three company. If it's in the UK, it's limited. If it's in America, it's called incorporated. It's a privately owned company owned solely by Mr. Smith. There is one share at $1. He owns it. He's the only director, the only owner. He's the 100% owner. He can make any decision he wants without any challenge. And if the company makes a profit, he can pay himself. It's called taking a dividend. A dividend is where the company, through its sales or its activities, has made a profit. And in addition, or instead of a salary, director can pay himself some money. He can take money out of the company. That's called a dividend. As the only owner of this company, Mr. Smith can pay himself as much dividend as he's entitled to based on the profit. Okay, cool. We have a company, 123 Incorporated, 123 Limited. Mr. Smith is the owner. The company charter is very simple. He makes all the decisions. He owns all the shares because there's one share. He can pay himself a dividend if he wants to if the company turns a profit. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, Mr. Smith wants to expand, he wants 123 to grow. So he needs some investment. Along comes Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones says, hello, Mr. Smith. I'll give you some money, but I want to own half the company. Okay, says Mr. Smith. The company charter is now edited. It is amended. There are now two shares. And those two shares could be worth the equivalent of a dollar each. The charter will be amended to say we have two owners. Each owner has one share, 50% ownership of the company. That's easy. So director one, director two, Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, 50% owner, 50% owner. That's easy. In terms of a dividend payout, if the company makes a profit, 50% of the dividend goes to Mr. Smith, 50% goes to Mr. Jones. That bit is easy. But what isn't so easy is to determine the actual shares themselves. So we have two shares worth exactly the same. Do we say that each share is the same value as the other one? Or do we have one share given a preferential status compared to the other? 
Now, Mr. Smith might say, well, I founded this company and I grew it, and I want to retain the overall control and have a greater influence and sway in how the company's going to move going forward, because it's my company. So therefore, I'm happy from a monetary perspective to give you 50%, but I want to have a greater influence. I want to have greater control in how the company is going to operate. Therefore, we can introduce a class system of shares. I will give your share a B status. It enables you and entitles you to a payout of dividends and to own a percentage of ownership of the company. However, mine is going to be status A. So if we need to have a discussion and choose the direction of the company, my vote carries more weight than yours. So it's given a preferential status. Now you can have two class A shares, one given preferential status over the other, or you can have two separate classes of shares, a B class and an A class, or vice versa. The charter will determine the category uh, and which share from whom is worth more. So if we take this and apply it to our Glazers model, we have Glazers Incorporated. We have six siblings. Those siblings, we are led to believe, have an equal ownership, monetarily speaking, of Glazers Incorporated. But what we don't know is if any of the Glazers have a preferential status over any of the others. The other thing that the company charter will state is how a motion is voted for. Now, what that means is when directors meet, usually they meet annually, but if there's something important, they can hold an extraordinary meeting. They will discuss various issues to do with the company. And of course, if they're called an extraordinary meeting, then there'll be topics they need to discuss as a matter of urgency. The charter will determine how those topics and how the subsequent decisions are decided. Now, in the case of the Glazers, you could easily have a situation where three vote in favour of something and three vote against it. Now, if somebody had a preferential status, their vote carries more. There is a chance, therefore, that the motion may pass or may fail, depending if somebody has a preferential vote or not, just like we said in the United Nations. But what we don't know if, if that is the case or not. What we think is none of the siblings have got preferential status over the others. So in our case with Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones, in our situation, Mr. Smith has more weight than Mr. Jones. So if they both vote one for, one against, Mr. Smith will win. We don't think that's the case with the Glazers here. So that makes decision making extremely slow and painful. Okay, so that makes it a little bit more straightforward. We understand how a privately owned company works. I own shares, I want to get some money into the company, I go to somebody else, I give a portion of my company to them, we can decide between us if I own more or less, or I've got more or less voting rights than they do. But what about on a publicly traded company? Well, actually, it's the same. You still have a charter. Now, provided I retain my initial investment, my shareholding in the company, my shares don't change. I can hold all of the preferential shares. I don't have to give any of those out. So when I make my shares available to be bought and sold on the stock market, I'm advertising what type of shares they are. Are they B class? Are they A class? Are they A class with preferential? I can advertise that and the price that they are going for. So I could sell a million B class shares, which means I only have to pay a certain amount to those people in terms of dividends. A percentage of the ownership of the company is relinquished from me onto those people who buy those shares. But even though they each get a voting right per share they buy, I still trump them through my preferential status. The same can be said of Class A shares. Although Class A shares can be sold with more voting rights, more power, more weight than a B class share, it doesn't mean that the A class share necessarily will affect the direction that the company goes in. Now, of course, if I only have a small shareholding within the business and I have a large number of other people who have bought A-class shares, the cumulative overall value of those shares could outweigh and trump me, of course. But in a scenario where I'm close to or exceeding 50% anyway, 
and I keep all the preferential status with me. I maintain the largest financial input within the business. Therefore, I can take the largest dividend for myself. I also retain control of the direction of the company through that weighting of ownership that I retain. All of this is recorded in a company charter. You have a charter regardless of whether it's a privately owned business or a publicly traded business. And that's why this charter is so important because it doesn't matter what's being bought and sold on the stock market or whether they're doing bond issue or they're trying to renegotiate better deals on their debt. Fundamentally, the overall parent company that owns all of these activities and owns Manchester United is this Glazer Incorporated one, the one that the, the six siblings are equal, so we assume, shareholders and owners of. So this charter is extremely important because it denotes not only who owns what and who gets paid what and dividends and what have you, but also how, as the ultimate benefactors of this business, decisions are to be agreed between the siblings. Therefore, if Manchester United are going to receive minority investment, a part sale or a full sale, it may well be that this charter determines that each sibling must vote in favour or must vote the same as every other sibling, a unanimous vote. And this charter may also prohibit an offer such as Sir Jim's from being accepted, where the other siblings, you know, sell and pack up and leave and one or more sibling remains and can stay thereafter. And this might also be part of the crux of the delay here, that additional negotiations need to happen between the siblings to make an amendment to the charter. But the fact is, we don't know, because no one has seen it. But that's why so much emphasis of this part of the video is on that charter, because it sets the rules of how the company looks, its ownership structure, the financials, but also the decision-making element as well. And that's the crucial part of this whole process. Now, yet despite this, we get these constant comparisons between the sale that's happening now and the sale that happened with Chelsea a year or so ago. That's a flawed comparison. You see, Chelsea were owned by one individual, Roman Abramovich, and although he had a holding company, he was the sole person. The other thing to consider is because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, wealthy Russians overseas had all of their assets frozen. They weren't allowed to own international assets. Chelsea had to be sold. If Chelsea were not sold, sanctions could be opposed onto them. There could be impositions restricting their ability to trade, therefore their ability to even be a football club. So by law, they had to be sold and a very finite fixed deadline of the end of May 2022 was imposed that if a bidder was not selected who was then looking to conclude that sale, Chelsea might well go out of business. So this was a completely different scenario and a completely different set of rules. Roman Abramovich set a price, he needed a quick sale, he found a load of bidders, Todd Bowley and his consortium were selected to go into some exclusive negotiations and they had to, uh, to conclude that deal by the end of May 2022. And of course they did. Here it's a little bit more complex. You're dealing with an entity that owns 69% of Manchester United, but that entity is made up of six equal board members as far as we're allowed to believe in terms of monetary and in terms of power and voting but they only own 69%. You've also got some other private owners who are owning somewhere between 10, 11, 12% of the club, and you've got around 18 to 20% that's floated on the stock market. This also makes it quite difficult to put together a accurate valuation of Manchester United. If you believe some reports, they believe that the club has a market capitalization of between two, two and a half, maybe three billion pounds. But that's based primarily on the factors that affect the stock market price. But the stock market price only affects a maximum of around 18 to 20% of the club. The ultimate owners are based in the Cayman Islands. We don't know the full extent of Manchester United's profit and loss and liabilities because of the limited nature that they have to disclose from the Cayman Islands. The level of reporting on a public limited company, company that's traded on the stock market, is very high and very granular. But what 
the glazers have to release to that is proportionate to the amount that you would own to that publicly traded part of the company. So there's a lot of cloak and daggers here, you see. What you could be potentially buying if you only look at the stock market is only a fraction of the greater piece of the puzzle. Now we can uh, analyze this in another way as well. You see the Glazers, as we said, borrowed basically 800 million pounds to buy Manchester United. Except they didn't. You see, because they're based in the States and they were doing their transactions through American banks going to European banks to buy Manchester United, their core initial currency is the dollar. So the dollar, before it gets converted either into euros or sterling to then set up a company here to buy the shares and acquire Manchester United, there is a conversion rate, of course. That conversion rate is also subjected to tariffs and commissions. Now, when this started from around 2003 going into 2004, you may remember that the dollar to pound ratio exploded. The dollar suddenly became very weak and it was worth around half a pound, 50 pence. Or to think of it another way, one pound was worth about two dollars. So you see, the Glazers were borrowing around 800 million sterling as was reported here. But actually, it was all about what they're borrowing core in the United States in dollars. So that dollar borrowing rate wasn't 1.6 billion. It was less. And it was only because of the exchange rates at the time and all the costs associated with the transactions that the amount is 800 million. The problem is, if we fast forward to today, the exchange rate has changed. And thanks to Liz Truss and Quasi, recently the pound has slumped. At one stage, the dollar, which on average was around 1.4 to the sterling, i.e. one pound worth $1.4, at one stage, it was less than 1.1. So if we analyze what the conversion rate was back in 2003, 2004, where the amount that they borrowed in dollars equated to 800 million pounds, recently, because of the exchange rate now being more favorable to the dollar, the debt value has grown to over 900 million. And that after 18 years of the various payments they've made, because it shows that the core debt, and again, this is because we go back to that Cayman Island company and the Delaware company, which owns all of the proxies in the UK, the core debt was in dollars. And because the exchange rate is more favorable to dollars, the amount in sterling has gone up proportionally as a result. So when Manchester United released their annual accounts recently and their liabilities, i.e. money that they owe to creditors, was almost a billion pounds, Manchester United fans were apoplectic, as you can imagine. But that figure's made up of any outstanding amounts that they owe as part of transfers, deferred wages, agents cuts if they're doing construction work and they've set budgets aside but they haven't spent it yet plus the debt now we also have to remember because of the exchange rates the amount they've been paying per year has varied as well at one stage annual amounts were as low as 14 to 16 million pounds that means the amount that manchester united are having to pay annually to satisfy repaying the debt but based on refinancing, or when there's been major expenditure, such as player transfers, and of course, negative exchange rates, that amount has gone up at some stages being more than 30 million a year. So as you can see, the amount of liabilities have ranged, and we don't know that full extent just by analyzing the stock market. Now, the reports are the Glazer family are looking for six billion sterling to sell Manchester United. If you listen to those same reports, they'll say that that is an overpriced valuation of Manchester United. But is it? Well, let's think about this. <clears throat> Manchester United, according to its stock market valuation, is probably worth around three billion pounds. But Manchester United have their billion strategy. Now that billion strategy is what Michael Knighton was talking about 
35 years ago when he first hatched his plan to buy Manchester United, except it's on steroids. You see, Manchester United, according to various reports, have as many as a billion followers worldwide. What that means, we don't really know. Are they avid fans? Do they buy the merchandise? Do they follow them on social media? Do they just give half the stuff? Or do they just recognise the badge from various marketing campaigns? We don't know. But basically, the club has around a billion people who are following it. If we do some quick maths, that's over a billion pounds a year in revenue. Now, if we think about this, the trends that we see in commerce now are all going through E, electronic, digital. Yes, we want to buy our merchandise. We want to buy the kit, the pencil case. We want to buy the lunchbox, all that kind of good stuff. But actually, more of what we're finding now is through streaming, online magazines, social media subscriptions, and other sort of digital content. What that means for Manchester United is there is a fixed price. They pay for their hosting platform, they pay annual subscriptions for their marketing solutions, they pay the salaries of their marketeers. But the more people that they buy, a compound effect happens where their profit goes up and up and up and up and up. So the cost per person comes down as they get closer and closer to that billion pound a year revenue target. Well, a billion pound a year revenue target would be extraordinary. And according to projections, United might actually be able to hit £1.2 a year in the near future. So you can understand why the Glazers put a significant amount of value on that revenue and profitability stream on top of the capitalization that they already have. Well, suddenly we're looking at a company which is worth possibly more than £4 billion straight away. You've then got to consider some of the other things, such as what does the brand kudos mean? To own Manchester United and everything that's associated with that has an almost intangible amount of money to it. You've also got to take into account assets they own. Old Trafford, another marquee, that would have a value to it. Then you've got the real estate where Old Trafford sits, the adjacent car parks and the trading ground in Carrington. When you add all of that up, actually you could make a strong case for United being worth £6 billion. Then you've also got to factor something else in. United aren't worth £6 billion. They're probably worth 10 Now, you might be confused and thinking, hang on a second, how does that work? Are they suddenly going to be getting £2 a year from their customers? Well, maybe, but that's not where we're going with this. You see... Old Trafford, we've seen videos and pictures through the years of its leaking roof and its dilapidated state. You're going to have to renovate it, expand it, or possibly knock it down and build it from scratch. You could be looking at as much as £2 billion of investment right there. Then you've got the training ground. If you listen to the Cristiano Ronaldo interview with Piers Morgan last year, Ronaldo said that the training ground had not been improved on since he left the club in 2009. That's 13 to 14 years ago. You could be looking at hundreds of millions of pounds of investment just on the training ground. Then you've got the playing squad. Although United have had a pretty good window this summer, you'd probably give it something like a 7 to a 7.5 out of 10. There's probably significant investment still required in the squad. And you could probably make a case for 2, 3, 4 or even 500 million pounds of additional investment still required. You add all of that together and you can quite easily see how as an overall asset when you put the investment into it to buy it and all of those improvements you need to do, United is actually probably £10 billion. So now we go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Do the Glazers want to sell? And that comes down to this charter. When we're talking about motions of this magnitude, do we need to have a unanimous decision amongst the Glazers in order for that parent company, the Glazers Inc., to agree to a sell. Now, the statement that they put out was they're exploring all avenues for external investment. That can range from a minority stake right up to a full sale. Now, it's important to state that because United have a significant amount of it floated on the stock market, they wouldn't be able to back out of a full sale without a significant investigation. It's not worth their while. They could be accused of stock market manipulation and other things, and also potentially bringing down the value of the club for them to negotiate aggressive preferential sales to some of the other 
uh, existing shareholders you can face jail time for that so it's important to state we believe their intentions are true that they are looking for external investment and possibly a sale but the question is how do we achieve that outcome now we're hearing so many reports from different sources and none of them know the Glazers at all. Some of them stating that Joel and Avram have got sentimental attachment to United. Some of them state that they have got this uh, excitement about the possibility of how much United could be worth. Remember, if United can achieve anywhere from one to two pounds a year per follower, that could be as much as one to two billion pounds a year revenue. That's a huge amount of money. And when you consider that is coming from digital sources, so your prices are fixed costs, the amount of profit is obscene. So they're seeing the dollar signs. You've also got those same reports stating that the other siblings don't really care for United and would actually prefer to cash in now during this global crisis and invest in something else more worthwhile or more interested in. We don't know. But the fact that there has been this stagnation in the process would lead us to believe that all glazers have an equal share with equal voting rights so in the event that every glazer sibling owns exactly the same amount as every other sibling and has exactly the same voting power as every other sibling we're in a position where we're waiting for this infighting amongst them this internal quabble to reach a unanimous outcome but the most likely outcome is <clears throat> that despite any protestations from Joel or Avram, United will negotiate either with Sir Jim Radcliffe or with Sheikh Jassim. Sir Jim Radcliffe, on the other hand, has come at it from a different angle and potentially has added to the complexity of the ongoing internal power struggle of the Glazers. You see, he's made two offers to buy the football club. The first is to buy the Glazers' 69% shareholding only. That would give him all of the Class A voting shares within the company. Effectively, what that means is even if somebody else owned the same number as him, his shares would be worth more in terms of deciding what the company is going to do. You and I can own 50% shares of the same company, making us equal owners, monetarily speaking. But if I own the higher priority shares, I get to make the decisions. So... So Jim's first offer is to buy the Glazers out only, and he'll worry about the other shares potentially later. His second offer is to buy 51% of the total of Manchester United. In essence, he would be buying the four main Gla uh, Glazer siblings who want to leave, and a proportion of Joel and Avram shares, probably denoting and reducing their share uh, voting status so that he owns all of the preferential shares and leaving them probably with around 10% each. Well, that now makes the Manchester United ownership pie slightly more complex. Out of our 100%, Jim Radcliffe would own 51%. The remaining 18 or so percent of the original Glazers' ownership would be split between Joel and Avram, but they probably wouldn't have 18% of preferential voting rights between them. They would probably agree to sell those to Sir Jim Radcliffe as part of the acquisition. Otherwise, why buy a voting uh, football club where you have 51% of the ownership, therefore take 51% of the dividends, but you don't have 51% control in deciding how the club's going to operate? So, <clears throat> undeniably, Sir Jim, as part of his deal, whichever one they take, will be for him to take all ownership shares within Manchester United. Now, the intricacies here are substantial. If they negotiate with Sheikh Jassim, his offer is to buy the 69%, an agreed price to buy the remaining 10 or 11% of private shareholders thereafter, and based on an agreed above market price on the, st on the stock market, to buy any publicly traded shares as well. That's what we call a full sale he would most likely delist manchester united from the stock market and probably have it as a sole limited company with a 100 percent shareholding of his own that's probably what he would do and that's the quickest easiest way to buy the football club the problem is deciding how that is valued and the mechanism of how such a deal would happen is complex and would probably need a period of exclusivity to work out the terms and timescales and values to agree on that 
But the problem is, to do that, you need all six Glazer siblings to agree to that. Because otherwise, if that wasn't the case, we probably would have already escalated that position already. If we don't need a unanimous decision from the Glazers through their parent company, their umbrella group, then if there was a 4-2 split in favour of a particular direction, that is probably the direction we would have gone down already. So by adding more options to the Glazers and appeasing their quench for probably money and power, he's actually probably helped to delay the process somewhat more. Now, I'm probably hearing a collective sigh of frustration at the sound of this being delayed more, but I should also point out it was only the end of November last year that the announcement came that United were even exploring this at all. And in deals of this magnitude and complexity, it is not uncommon for a takeover process to take at least a year. You see, you would have multiple rounds of bidders from which you would typically select an exclusive bidder that you would negotiate the finer details and timescales with. At that point, a final bid would be put forward. A contract would be put on the table disclosing when payments are to be made, how they're to be made, and so on. But then the due diligence needs to be done by the local agencies of government and other agencies to determine if this can be sanctioned. That could easily take 12 to 18 months. We're not there, we're not there yet. So although Sir Jim has put multiple offers on the table, which potentially gives him numerous ways to, to win this race, and yes, that probably adds to the delay because the Glazers are in a position where they are, how can we put it, discussing it amongst themselves. It doesn't add any overall delay to the process because this would still take probably more than a year to close anyway. We also need to consider the amount of debt that Manchester United has. The debt which is primarily in dollars converted to sterling and the debt that's been ramped up through deferred payments, ongoing construction and other upkeep costs. We can't obviously ignore the fact that inflation pays a, a part here as well. Sheikh Jassim, contrary to any reports you've read about him, has no issues whatsoever in terms of wealth. You see within the Gulf states, family and family wealth is more important than an individual's. So even if you look at the leaders of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mansour, who bought Manchester City, his individual wealth might only be reported in the tens of billions, but the actual resources that he has at his disposal are in the hundreds, if not trillions of dollars, because that's how the finances and how you access finances and wealth in the Gulf states work. If we move to Saudi Arabia, of course, through their public investment fund who have just bought Newcastle United, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has a reported net worth of something in the region of 30 to 40 billion dollars, which of course is ludicrous. He has an almost limitless supply of money through the various resources and avenues that he can access. So although Sheikh Jassim might only have a reported personal wealth in the two to three to ten billion dollars, yes, casually just throwing away a few billion there, what he actually has access to again, is an almost unlimited pool of family money. That is how this would be financed, and that's how Manchester United would be financed moving forward if he wins this race. Any debt that United have accrued, any commitments they have as a result of the original acquisition by the Glazers, would be wiped off near immediately if Sheikh Jassim was to win the race. What is less clear is how Sir Jim Radcliffe would do the same if he buys whichever option he's put forward is successful. You see, Manchester United have refinanced their debt several times over. They've got payment in kind loans, which is a way of paying loans off in a different kind of manner other than a flat monetary figure. They've got bond issues and other liabilities that we've discussed already. What's unclear is what the plan would be from him to pay those off. So that adds to the complexity and to the time and to the delay of potential negotiations as well. So is it all doom and gloom? Are we stuck in a never-ending cycle where this saga might just go on and on and on and on and on? No, don't worry, we're not. You see, as already explained, the Glazers have a significant amount of Manchester United floated on the stock market. 
Now that they've made this announcement, which they had to do to satisfy regulations to do with the stock market, they're going to have to follow through in one way or the other. Now, it's probable that if you asked all of them as a collective, <clears throat> their preference would be for minority investment to come in so that they can reap the rewards of future Manchester United revenue growth. But if reports are to be believed that the majority of the siblings have had enough and would rather focus on something else, and who could blame them? With all the protests and dragging the family name through the mud, if it was me, I would probably want to get out as well because I don't fancy having my name trips through the mud all day, every day. So the likelihood is they will do a full sale. And we know that there are only two main bidders in the running, Sir Jim Radcliffe and Sheikh Jassim. So you're going to ask me now, who's going to win this? Well, that's an easier question to ask than answer. You see, because we believe that there has to be a unanimous decision at the end of this amongst the Glazers, the question would be, how well do they get on? You see, Sir Jim has tabled an offer for all of them to sell up and leave, for, to buy 69% of Manchester United. The question is, is that 69% enough for all of them to say, yes, let's take the money and run? That's your first question. If the answer to that was yes, it would have been done already. So clearly the offer for Sir Jim there isn't quite enough. So what about the alternative, which is a complete sell to the, of the club to Sheikh Jassim? Well, that would probably make most sense because no one gets a preferential cut of this pie. Everyone gets paid an equal piece to give their share up, their preferential voting rights, to buy the public shares, everything. The problem is, Sheikh Jassim's bid is probably also short of what has been asked for. Again, otherwise the deal would have been done. The second question then is his 51% offer. Now, if the Glazer siblings are predominantly wanting to leave, but two of them have been given the option to stay on, are you the sort of family that is supportive to your fellow brothers and say, yeah, crack on, you go and get 9% each and reap the rewards from Manchester United in the future? Or are you a tad more jealous? And are you now thinking, hmm, maybe I'd like a piece of that pie as well? So now you've almost put the cat amongst the pigeons. Have you shot yourself in the foot, said Jim, by putting that on the table? We don't know. Again, if that figure was enough, if that bid was enough, and Joel and Avram were sweet enough talkers to talk their siblings round, the deal would have been done already. The likelihood is the Glazer siblings aren't that supportive and are probably thinking, hmm, if we're not going to get a piece of that pie, we don't want Joel and Avram to either so that's probably added a little bit of delay in that regard as well so now we get to another point is there scope in negotiations for either of the bidders to increase their bid just the raw money that's put up on the table or is there scope for improved and more preferential payment terms to be negotiated with these bidders because if you had a figure of six billion in mind but you're only potentially going to get five or five and a half if the way that that money is transferred and the speed at which is transferred or some other terms can be negotiated so they're more favorable than standard terms for such a transaction that might help to close this as well now it should also be pointed out that the normal way that you would do this process depending on how many rounds of bidding that you do would be to appoint somebody to have a period of exclusivity. That's where they can come in and check the books and make sure that everything's in order. They then put one final valuation with a set of terms, which becomes the contract of acquisition on the table. And assuming that that is satisfactory to the seller, you sign it and off it goes for approval and the sale happens. Now this does slightly delay the pre-sale process because you're jumping through hoops that you would normally jump through when you've got a period of, get, of exclusivity when you can analyze the books ask whatever questions do some sort of forensic analysis that you want to make sure you're happy to put your bid there to, to close the sale however by doing it now you don't add too much delay because you would have to do it later anyway the difference is 
you're jumping through these hoops now that you would normally do when you've got the books in front of you or you can have these discussions in a manner which gives you a period of exclusivity to do so but the fact that it's being done now will actually accelerate the process once a nominated bidder is appointed so we haven't lost any time per se the big variable will be how the glazer family as a collective are going to arrive at a decision and which of the parties comes through all those checks looking the best which comes to terms and other things which we can only speculate on but that will be between the glazers and that party via their appointed council the rain group so it is complex and it is going to take time if i was put if i was going to put money on the table i would expect either sir jim's offer of 51 percent to be accepted or Sheikh Jassim's total acquisition of the club to be accepted. I don't think the 69% offer will be accepted because if it was that good a deal, it would have been done already. So I think you can probably put that to one side. Sheikh Jassim has shown the most amount of flexibility so far in terms of putting in bid after bid after bid. Now, whether that's just raising the value of that bid or changing some of the terms, speed of transfer, method of transfer, whatever it might be, we don't know. But it would appear that he's shown the most amount of flexibility to get the deal done. So if the Glazers are looking to negotiate and find that perfect compromise between where they're prepared to sell and what he's prepared to buy, it would it would make sense for, Sir, for Sheikh Jassim to be that person right now. And I would probably say 60-40, it's going to be Sheikh Jassim that wins this race. Anyway, I hope this video has helped to shed some light and add some clarity as to all the various wheels which are turning here. Regulations to do with the stock market, the fact that we're dealing with people based in the United States, the Middle East, and for an asset that's based here in the UK with the different regulations and the way that money is pulled together from the Middle East or how it's put together from the UK, where it's ultimately going to go to, the additional costs once you've bought the club, how you delist it from the stock exchange. There's a lot of things going on here, but it's also important to stress that in terms of a time frame, it was always going to be around 12 months plus. That should also be reminded to everyone. And looking at the Chelsea sale is a very bad idea. The Newcastle sale, for example, when Mike Ashley sold to PIF, that took about a year. And that was with just one owner as well. So that's a more accurate reflection to, to give you an idea of time frames and will they, won't they, and all that kind of thing. So Manchester United fans shouldn't lose heart by any means. If there's anything within this video which was unclear or you would like answered, please answer, you know, ask your questions in the comments or send me some DMs here on YouTube. I will reply. I hope you found this to be informative and helpful to help explain why we are seeing some delay, where some of the issues potentially sit. And yes, we are probably slowly moving towards a, a resolution which should satisfy Manchester United fans. If you like the video, please hit the like button. I'd really appreciate it if you, if you hit subscribe, and I'll catch you on another video soon.